broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good morning, everybody. Christine Westerland here um, from the Illinois Association of Community Action Agencies and... Susan Wilson from CEFS in Effingham. So happy that you are with us today on our continuing series of Roma. We are still working our way through the Introduction to Roma Manual. Um, so this is webinar number four, right, Susan? Am I rem am number I keeping four already? Yes. Yeah, that's that's hard to imagine. Um, and you know, um, fun story. Um, when I uh, decided to do the first Roma webinar, I checked. I do check the registration rolls, and I saw Susan's name, and I thought, oh my gosh someone who may consider um, co-presenting. And I reached out to Susan and you graciously agreed to do it. And you are uh, have been, been a great partner through this, Susan. So thank you for your willingness to be a part of it. Well, thank you, Christine. You are the one who trained me in Roma because you are the Roma queen of Illinois. <laughs> and so everything I know came through you. Yes, so thank but, you. well, my pleasure, but believe me, I think you bring, you know, you have a background in education and I think that you bring a lovely, a lovely dynamic to this that I don't have that, that skill. So I, I really appreciate it. So I've been learning quite a bit from you as well. Maybe we compliment each other and we can present this well to our audience and thank you all for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. So happy you're here. And I know that we, we have some folks that have been our, our great supporters through each one of these webinars. So a special shout out to all of you. Um, um, as a reminder for all of us, we are uh, really delighted that we're partnering with DCEO in this uh, collaboration webinar. Um, this is an ongoing series. Um, given that we are currently in a time in which we have to look more towards remote learning opportunities, um, DCO has been a great supporter of this. And also they um, really want um, every agency to have a high level of Roma expertise so we can uh, use Roma to tell our stories of success. And here are once again our mugs. Maybe we should um, put new pictures up at some point, Susan, what do you think? Not till I get my hair cut. <laughs> Good point. That's an excellent point. All right. Yes, because my hair is, is you, I don't want to talk about it. That's it. Um, the, so there we are. So you know who, who we look like. And as we do is our custom when we kick off all of these uh, webinars that we do recite together, the promise of community action. So do this how you would like it, out, either out loud or silently. But this is a statement that I think really drives this work forward and illuminates for us just um, how important our work is, especially during this time. So the promise of community action. Community action community changes action people's changes lives. Changes people's lives. Embodies the spirit of, of hope. Improves communities. Improves community. And makes America and makes a better place, place, to, place live. to live. We care we about care the entire about community. The entire community. And we and are we dedicated, dedicated to helping to helping people, people help themselves, help themselves and each and other. Each other. So just as a note um, for our, all of you as we proceed, and I know that you, you probably know what I'm going to say, number one, this session is being recorded. We will make it available on the ICA YouTube channel, um, so look for it there if you want to share it with your peers and colleagues or if you want to review, we would encourage you to do that. Um, also, use the dashboard to ask any questions. Um, both Susan and I um, will keep an eye on if questions come up, and we'd be more than happy to respond to your questions or comments as we move forward. Whether live or later on, please. Yeah, ex absolutely. Um, so in this session, we are going to focus on measurement tools and processes. And I think this is kind of, we're, we're kind of getting to, um, is it where the rubber meets the road? Is that that tired old statement that we hear quite a bit these days. Tired? Was that a pun, Christine? <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> it could have been. So we really want to dive into this question um, of what are our measurement tools? What do we already have available to us? Um, are, do we view them as a measurement tool or we just do we view them simply as something that we take for granted at the organization? Uh, so to really look at measurement tools from the perspective of we're measuring both outputs and outcomes. And uh, just to kind of put a pin in it, it's really what a data collection or measurement tool must be able to do is to capture data for each program or service, quantifying both the outputs and the outcomes. 
All right, remember that an output is what services you provided, what activities the customers were involved in. And so you do measure those with uh, intake forms or attendance logs or uh, payment records, all different kinds of ways, uh, depending on what your, uh, your, your program does. Because I run the adult literacy program, we do um, attendance. We, we do count hours of face-to-face uh, -face tutoring. And then for outcomes, those are different. That's what changes happened, what conditions improved, or sometimes what stayed stable. So for me, it's pre-tests and post-tests. We do the TABE, Test of Adult Basic Education, and that is our outcome. Did they raise reading levels? Did they raise math levels? Uh, it could be financial records showing an increase in, in family income, employment records proving that they worked, school reports showing um, a gain in skills. And sometimes it's, a, it's a qualitative, like observation logs. Uh, did, uh, can you observe changes in behavior? Those are outcomes, changes, uh, improvement. And sometimes it's staying stable. If someone is at risk of being homeless and you prevent homelessness, the staying stable is indeed an outcome. Great. Great, great explanation, Susan, and great examples, I think, from the work that we do. So we have to understand that it's equally important to measure our outputs um, so we can realistically measure our outcomes. And I'm hung up for a minute here. Let me see if I can't move this slide forward. Okay. Um, we also have to appreciate the fact that uh, data um, has data quality, I should say, has many different dimensions. Uh, so we see this list here um, that uh, that allows us to understand why data quality um, has to be what it is. So is it complete? So does that mean no information is missing? Is it accurate? Are there no mistakes? Timely. That means that data is collected on time, you're doing it routinely and regularly, and is it recent enough to be pertinent? And is it reliable? Data is collected in, is, is meaningful, I guess that, should, that word should be, not in, and is collected the same way every time. And staff who are involved understand why they are responsible. Yes, I think that's important because um, we need to avoid duplicating our counts. Um, if a family is served by many different programs, and that's perfectly fine, in fact, it's, it's usually most beneficial, but uh, are we counting the families only once? Do we have unduplicated counts? And in order for that, we have to be complete, accurate, timely, and reliable. Absolutely. So we also want to identify evidence, and this is a key piece of the work that we do as well. Identifying evidence uh, is something that we can really throw it back to Peter Drucker, um, in which that he uh, really reminds us that we have to measure both the qualitative and quantitative measures of outcomes and outputs. Yeah, we do sort of um, push this, but there's, there is a difference, and we, we need to understand that qualitative is things like observation or self-reported status or progress reports, satisfaction surveys. Whereas quantitative is more numeric, it's more it's it's more measurable on a scale, like pretest and post-test scores, or a self-sufficiency scale. Did they go from in crisis to uh, stable? Rent receipts are quantitative. You can prove that someone um, paid their rent or that the rent was paid. Uh, the number of meals provided is quantitative. You can count those. Right, so it's really, it really does answer that question then, right? What, how do you know? And I think that is probably the key question that drives our measurement of both outputs and outcomes. How do you? Mm, I wonder who was an expert at that, Christine? Let's see. No, I don't know. Who do you think? Let's, let's <laughs> see what the next slide says. All right, well, move ahead here. There it is. There's, there's who, who thought about it, right? Throwing it back. Oh, Drucker. To our guy, to our man, Peter Drucker. Woohoo! Back to Drucker. Right. So this is a quote from uh, Peter Drucker, and I'll just go ahead and read it because I think it, there's some nice, nice 
wisdom included in here, and it includes a couple of my very favorite words. Um, progress and achievement can be appraised in qualitative and quantitative terms. These two types of measures are interwoven. They shed light on one another. Both are necessary to illuminate in what ways and to what extent lives are being changed. All right. Now, uh, you may have heard us say that qualitative measures, it's easy to remember because of the L in qualitative. Think of letter, letters and words and uh, text, whereas quantitative has the N, like numbers, uh, measurable qu uh, quantities, numbers. Um, and those of you who've been exposed to Roma before might know we like to use our baseball analogies. So when, it, when you think about a baseball game, uh, the bottom line is the final score. But if the only thing that mattered was the final score, nobody would be going to the games, nobody would be talking about them. All they would do is say, what's the score? And that's the end. But we also want to know things like, did anybody hit a grand slam? How many people did your favorite pitcher stri strike out? Those are quantitative, those are numerical. But we also want to know qualitative. Was it an exciting game? Were the fans satisfied? Which team is your favorite? Did you discuss the fairness of baseball players' salaries? Most topics can be just as much a part of the game experience. Things like, did you dare to put ketchup on your hot dog or did you stick with mustard like you're supposed to and have a great snack? Those are qualitative. It's a depth of analysis outside of the numbers. And you know, we like to go to ball games regardless of the final score. So both are important, qualitative oh, and quantitative. Right, and I really appreciate the fact that you um, made the comment that if you put ketchup on your hot dog, that is an abomination. Indeed. Yes, so, so putting a pin on that. <laughs> so, so again, thinking about that question, how do you know, right? So here are some, some things that you can ponder in answering that question, right? So what proof can you provide that an outcome has been achieved? What documentation do you have? How do you know that it is related to the service, the output, provided? These are, I think, critical questions um, for you to, to, again, to really think and embed whenever you're looking at your outcomes, looking at your outputs, and not only connecting them, but understanding that there has to be a clear channel of information to reach that outcome. We, we know that CSB, CSBG services are successful, but if it's not on paper, we can't prove it. So prove it. Absolutely. And then you wanna consider some of the processes that are in place. Um, so when you select measurement tools, you're gonna to wanna to think about these things. Susan, do you wanna? Okay, so who will be responsible for the data collection and storage? Who reviews the data? How frequently? How often is it collected? How often is it reported? And what happens to the data? So it is your uh, information, is it put in stars? Is it put in paper files? Is it put on an Excel sheet? It could be all of those or just some of those. It depends on your agency, depends on your program, it depends on your data, but people should know what is protocol for who, what, where, and how, and how often. Absolutely, absolutely. So again, you, this is where I, I believe that we need to take our time, if you will. So some of this may become routine. I think again, we're in a time now where we're gonna be measuring all sorts of new things, right? And so you're gonna to wanna to think about what measurement tools that you're going to be want to use um, and some of them may be very familiar, some of them may be unique. So to be thinking through all of these questions whenever you're considering your approach to reporting. Um, mm. So yeah, so we wanna talk about some soft outcomes and um, other slippery slopes. Just to, again, to remind us, I know that one thing that I have heard about um, for years in community action is that I, you know, I want to see my customers, um, I, want their, I want them to see their self-confidence grow. And that's absolutely 
a, a thing that we do want to see happen, certainly. But it's difficult to measure self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, I have followed that through the years to see if there are tools that can do that. Every once in a while, I'll hear some breakthrough, and then they immediately dismiss it as they can't validate it. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, okay. Um, self-esteem, personal goals, self-reporting, these can be valid, but sometimes self-reporting is about all you have to go on. And customer service satisfactions, well, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I run the adult literacy program, and once I got a phone call from an angry wife. Her husband signed up for the literacy program. Uh, it never came back. We did send him postcards. We did try to phone him. He never came back, but the wife was irate that his reading did not improve at all. I think she was under the impression that once he signed up, his skills would just improve, and she had a very bad review for me. But you know what? You have to take it with a grain of salt because it was her interpretation of my failure of services, not really. So, you know, uh, satisfaction surveys, sometimes you have to take them or leave them. But anything that you can do to verify or confirm, authenticate, uh, an outcome, um, and sometimes if you don't think you can quantify it, try to put it on a five-point scale. We'll talk about those more, but maybe you can use it because uh, then it is quantifiable. So much of it is soft and, like you say, slippery, things like mm, self-esteem. Not that self-esteem is unimportant. Of course it's important, but it's very, very difficult to measure, and uh, therefore it's very difficult to report. Yeah, and. Uh I, I will just say one more thing about antidotal stories. I, and I think that's one thing that uh, we do in this network is that we tell great stories to one another about success and things that we have seen and, and observed. But we also have to use anecdotal stories if there is data to back it up. Um, you know, that might be a, a piece of data that you've seen um, people with uh, school success um, and then that's when you pull out then that anecdotal story to kind of support what you've stated in that data or using that data. Right. The, the families of distinction um, usually have quite a bit of both. They've got the, the hard data to show an increase in income or stability of housing or an increase in education. But then there's a, those backstories that are so emotional. So uh, go ahead, use what you can. Prove, prove that you're doing good work. Absolutely, and, and thanks and thanks for bringing in that families of distinction. Um, you know, it's our goal to have every every agency have a an FOD family. So, um, I know that we've postponed our conference and that celebration to later this year. We're still hoping that we can have it, but be thinking about who you need to celebrate and want to celebrate as a great example of the work of your agency. There's also some shortcuts, which makes makes me really happy. And Susan, I heard you mention one already um, earlier. So do you want to kind of dive into what some of these pre-existing measurement tools are? Sure. There's nothing wrong with borrowing good ideas. And so uh, if, if another agency or another program has a measurement tool that you can use, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Uh, and for adult literacy, one of the tools we use uh, for quantitative assessments, it's the TABE, the Test of Adult Basic Education. We also use some other things, the SORT, the Slauson Rural Reading Test. And uh, without going into the entire alphabet of adult literacy, I will just say that uh, there are other things. I know WIOA uses the TABE as well. Um, other organizations or other, age, uh, other programs, Head Start has fabulous performance standards. They're like the, uh, the best uh, as far as getting quantified outcomes and results. Um, United Way. Uh, Christine, do you have something to share about the United Way and their shortcuts to uh, measurements? Yeah, ab absolutely. The United Way is, I think, really one of the premier organizations um, that understands outcomes and pathways to get there. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell an anecdotal story. I, I, am, um, I serve on a visioning council um, for the United Way of Central Illinois, and our discussion, is, our area of focus is financial stability. And it is exciting to be in the room in which we are using a tool that everybody understands that we're discussing outcomes 
uh, and outputs obviously on our way to achieving those outcomes. And it is such a rich data filled um, discussion, but at the end of the day, we understand what programs um, that United Way supports um, in financial stability programs, what programs are working and working well, and what programs need some help. So it, it's something that we, we really need to be willing to take on some of their work. And I can tell you, they have a beautiful outcome guide, and I don't know if any of you have seen it, um, but I would recommend uh, just you know, looking it up, Google it, and, uh, and, and check it out. All right, let's go on. All right. So here we have um, just kind of a snapshot of family level measurement tools and process. So we want to think about, um, you know, when, when we're putting this all together, you want to think about what tools you use for outputs who will be responsible for outputs, how will it be collected, and what's the frequency of data being collected. So this is a time for you to think about what measurement tools you would use for your outputs. And again, creating that chain so you understand clearly what is it, who's responsible, where do we know, um, how will it be collected, what's the frequency of data collection and reporting. And we use that very same process when we're thinking about what outcomes are. And look, it's the very same questions. These right. are the these are the last three columns of the logic model. So um, how will you measure your outputs? Is that the number of trainings completed, the number of meals served, the number of furnaces replaced, the number of vouchers provided, who collects the data, and some examples of who, how often, and how would be um, inspection results. Uh, that are done upon completion of a service, and those inspection results are placed in a coordinator's filing cabinet. Another example could be weekly observation log on Excel spreadsheets, or a monthly rent receipts put in the director's filing cabinet, or maybe certificates earned that that information is placed in STARS and updated quarterly. So often the data is put in more than one place, by more than one person. So who does it? Is it written down somewhere who does it? Is it written down how often they do it or when it's done quarterly, monthly, upon service? Documenting this information clarifies the duties for experienced staff and it makes it a whole lot easier to train new staff. So then how will you measure the outcomes? That would be the certificates earned, reduced bills, post-tests, and again, who, how often, and where. All right. Yeah, uh, thank you, Susan. And it, it just occurred to me that um, one, one thing that agencies may want to consider, and I'm, I'm throwing this out here just for your consideration, is that if you have this all clearly thought out, make sure that you have documented that somewhere. Perhaps you have a flow chart or a process map. Um, that you've used at the at your agency, so you can see who is what, who is responsible for what and where. Um, I think that would really help you, especially during these times in which we're going to be working um, with families that we've never seen before, and to be clear on how you're going to measure it and follow it. So now we're going to jump into um, outcome scale, scales and matrices. So exciting, right, Susan? I mean, come you know on. What? I, I like these. Um, first of all, they're clear, they're simple, but it is also sometimes you can find a way to quantify things you didn't realize that you could quantify before. So uh, I do. I like scales and matrices. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they're a bit of a hoot, and it's something that actually we're um, kind of familiar with, right? So there's a picture of a gas gauge. So now we'll compare a gas gauge to the CSBG monitoring and assessment task force scale that was created in the 1990s. Our very own Gray Warner from Illinois um, was a part of that group, and we still are using this very same scale today. Um, so we understand, right? Um, right? If your if your gas tank is full. It's got that F that you are thriving. You can get to where you want to go. Um, if you if your gas tank is on empty, uh, then you're in crisis. Um, that means you can't go very far. You need to stop. You need to buy gas. You may run out of gas. And and I don't know about any of you, but I have had that happen to me before because my my brain plays a game when that 
when I see that E kicks in. Um, and um, I have failed each time that my, that that happens to me. Um, but we know that if we are F, we're thriving um, at full, but at three quarters of a tank, we're still very safe. You know, we still have, you know, uh, the high probability of getting to where we want to go without worrying about what the level of gas is in our vehicle. Um, if we're at a half tank, we're still very stable. Um, again, we're optimistic that we can get there. We don't really need to worry or think about it. But once we reach the quarter tank, that means when that's when vulnerability kicks in. Do I have enough? Can I get there? And then, of course, we've already discussed E. In crisis. In crisis, indeed. So the question has to be then, um, when do we intervene in this time frame, right? Or within within this within this scale that we're using, right? So if you'll see here, there in this particular matrix, there is a prevention line that has been added in, um, and it is between the half tank and the one quarter tank, or between stable and vulnerable. So what that means is, is that if you drop below this blue line and you are either have a quarter of a tank or that also means that you become vulnerable, that means an intervention needs to happen. In this case, it just means stop at the nearest gas station. That's right. Sometimes it's more immediate than that. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you have to send somebody to go get you some gas. That's very true. It's very true. So again, I think this is something that we really have, a, I think, a very firm understanding on. And there are other scales that we use in our life. Every day we're walking in and out scales. I know, um, and I'm, I'm sure you do it too, uh, Susan, I'm constantly checking what the indoor and outdoor temperature is. Um, especially now, because I know that you, you have a, you run your farm and you are constantly probably watching, watching the weather. Well, after what the frost did to my asparagus crop last week, yeah, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> mm, yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. So, um, so I think that the point here is is that we we know actually somewhat intuitively where that prevention line exists. So we can take this model and then we can apply this in the work that we do in community action by using an outcome scale. And so. We'll show you a scale here in the next slide, but we really think that the scale does help us see that bigger picture of what a customer is experiencing, and it allows the measurement of change, and we can use, actually use it as a comparative value. Yes. Um, we identify progress and time progression. These are two important things that we need to look at, and how long does something take? You know, what, you know, we know that things are not immediate, and so, you know, what is, and everybody is different, so what is the progression of time? Right, some things are immediate, like a bed for tonight, and some things are long-term, like earning a certificate or a degree. Absolutely. It's also really key that we capture incremental change, right, because you don't go from not having that certificate to having that certificate immediately, right? There's there's work that needs to be done to to get to that certificate. So this is an I this is a way for us to really look at, at the steps that have to be taken and then we can understand or perhaps we need to shift things shift some of our processes because we need to make that change internally. You also want to be able to identify where progress has not happened. That's a very key thing to to look at as well, because if why why hasn't progress happened? You know, is it is it an issue with the customer that you're working with? Is it a customer in or a, an issue with how the program is structured, or is it an internal problem or an internal issue within the agency that you need to tweak a little bit? You also is a great way to recognize any movement that happens in a positive direction. And that is such a key place um, to demonstrate to the customer, if you're using this with the customer directly, that this is where you have been so successful. That is a motivating uh, place to be and really encourage you to be a part of that conversation. And it also supports case management, family coaching, um, plans to move forward towards stability and self-sufficiency. All right. Okay. So here's a housing scale. Um, this is important because uh, I think number one is housing of choice. Uh, are, are the people satisfied where they're at? 
where someone in crisis might be unsafe or have no housing or have, um, you know, for example, no heat. That would be in crisis if, if it's February. Uh, and uh, again, we have a five point scale, same as your gas gauge. Uh, but I will tell you that it's, this is where the self-reporting comes in. If you've heard me speak, you've heard me talk about my niece, Jillian. Uh, I love Jillian and she really does, she really does live in a van down by the river in Cooper Landing, Alaska. She is happy as can be. She would not want any intervention. She loves her freedom of living in a van down by the river. She saves all her money for world travel. Last year, she bought a one-way ticket to Cambodia. She stayed sleeping out on the beach. She volunteered to teach English in a school. And then she went back to Alaska when she darn right felt like it. She is thriving on a self-reported scale. She's at, uh, in 11 on this. But someone else might say, well, she's living in a van in Alaska. She doesn't have running water or electricity. She is in crisis. So notice, though, that on Thriving, it says housing of choice. And that is truly Jillian's choice. And some people I know choose to be homeless. That also is a choice. So we have to be careful not to put our own prejudices into this. We have to go by what? Uh, what they say their situation is like and if they want a change and how can we document where they're at and where they need to be. Yeah, absolutely, um, Susan. And, and I, I love I love hearing that story about your niece because it, it, it inspires me to think that um, that type of life is really, I think, uh, amazing. Um, but <laughs> would, would I be willing to do it or able to do it? Probably not. Uh, so, but again, I think, I think you make a very good point though. It is housing of choice. And so this is where in non-subsidized, um, so she is living at her choice. Um, it, she's probably taking care of all of her expenses herself. And so she doesn't have to worry about subsidies to support her. Um, that means she is thriving. She is independent. Now you'll notice on this benchmark that each one of these, um, we've switched it. We have five points on the scale, but you can have a numeric value and typically these are zero to 10. So here that you'll see that you're um, thriving is nine to 10. That means that you are independent. You can see that in safe. You can see that in stable. But look at that, there's that prevention line again. And that's where when we see st um, stable, which is a five or six, that you have limited choice of housing, it's non-subsidized, um, or it could be subsidized, then that might be a place where you may want to consider intervention, particularly if they are at risk of losing their home. That means they would become vulnerable or perhaps in crisis. That means that may become homeless. Perhaps they are living with uh, family members or get that what's called couch surfing. Um, so there are ways though that you need to plot where individuals are when you're working with them on a scale so you can understand where you need to intervene at any given point in their lives in the programs that you have. All right. Okay. So um, administering an outcome scale. And I think this is kind of a key, just a key piece of learning for us is that when you measure movement on the scale, it'll be inaccurate if you haven't, if you haven't placed that, uh, the, if you haven't done the initial um, placement correctly. And this is where, as, as Susan's example with, with her niece, Jillian, is that this is where the voice of the customer becomes so important because they have to clearly be able to define for you what that initial placement is. So that can be that baseline from which that you will move forward working with that customer. Uh, yes, you need a reliable baseline. A re reliable method to establish baselines. Absolutely. All right. So you also want to consider um, documenting placement on your outcome scale. Again, this is a, this is a observation. This is a work that we do all the time if we're a family case manager, that as customer progress is observed, it is essential to document any movement, both within and across the scale benchmark. And, 
and each benchmark should have associated outcomes. So again, be very clear in your program planning, putting on, together your scale for measurement, what are, some, what are the likely associated outcomes? And that data needs to be gathered from an appropriate measurement tool. I can tell you there are um, several uh, scales out there available already. Um, that's a, those pre-existing tools. Um, we do use a scale. Um, the association has a scale that we have offered. Um, so if that is an interest to you, I'm certainly would be happy to get that to you to take a look at. Um, I. Uh, was able to work with the Family Distinction Program and offer a scale to help um, agencies vet their families uh, for Family of Distinction using that scale. So again, we're happy happy to help you where we can. Always. Yes. And I, I know that we've already alluded to this, but I think it's important that we bring it forward again, is that when you're reporting using an outcome scale, we have three possibilities after that initial assessment process and where you've placed that individual. You could be looking at positive change, you could be looking at negative change, or you would be observing no change. All three of those are equally important. It's about documentation. Yes. Yes, and that is exactly it. If there's no change, make sure that you write down no change. So now we're going to shift then and look at an outcome matrix, but especially if you're working in case management or family coaching, you, um, you want to lay out your domains side by side using the scale. So this is the domains you'll see that we would be measuring um, and looking from thriving to in crisis in income, in employment. I'm sorry, go ahead. Of course, you can modify this to fit your situation. This is not written in stone. You can make your own matrix that fits your program, your agency, and your customers. But go yeah. ahead, Christine. No, that's a really uh, no, and I'm really happy that you've made that point because yeah, this is not carved in stone. This is simply an example um, of what this would look like, particularly in in perhaps a case management um, situation, but you could you could put all all sorts of different domains within this within this outcome matrix. Um, housing, education and training, transportation and childcare, then you can take your scale points, your benchmarks from thriving to in crisis, embed that prevention line between stability and vulnerability. And then you can use this to really describe in each one of these areas within the scale where, where that individual or individuals are within each of these domain areas. Yes, uh, these matrices capture agency data across programs and services. So staff could take a high-risk family at intake and complete this matrix. Then quarterly or whatever's appropriate, their progress could be documented. In the full training that Christine and, and some others uh, and I do, we look at matrices that have multiple dates inside each box as outcomes are met and progress is assessed. I like these matrices because sometimes you'll hear things like, oh, I can't get a job because I can't afford a car to get there, or I can't afford a car because I don't have a job. And the matrices really map out the relationships of domains, benchmarks, and successes. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that's exactly what it is, right? It is a, it, it really creates a map where you can see where a family um, or a program, you could use this for a program perspective too, where you're at at any point if you're willing to commit to using an outcome scale matrix. Uh, so some of these characteristics, um, just to help us kind of flesh this out a little bit more, um, that some of the things that an outcome scale matrix can capture that incremental change over across the scales and over time. Um, it's important that you capture agency data across multiple programs and services. And again, it's it's an opportunity to de-silo, if you will, because weatherization and LIHEAP and Head Start and transportation, all of those programs that many of our agencies have, we have to be, we know that many of our families are in and out of each of those programs. And it's also impacting the work or telling the agency story. So we have to look at it across all the programs. 
especially if you're working uh, using a outcome scale matrix with a client or a customer, this is a great a tool to identify areas of strength, especially when those individuals are above the prevention line or perhaps where improvement is needed. But again, if you can point out areas of strength, that is a great place of motivation for your customers and to use it from that perspective. Oh, and build upon those strengths. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think the other piece of it that um, I really, really love is that it really does identify the relationship between the different domains. Because even if we go back, let's see if I can go back to the previous slide without messing things up. I did, whoo. Um, we know that each one of these domain areas are very much interconnected with one another, income, employment, housing, education and training, transportation and childcare. These are, these are kind of the essential needs that many of us work with. And we know that if we have, if we've been able to cover each of these, then we've been able to really work in collaboration uh, in, in really, I think a profound way. Um, so, and then this is also a great tool that allows you to create a mini needs assessments, especially if you're looking at um, a collection of customers who have been in programs um, like this over the, over, the, over the year or six months that you could really see areas that where the programs have worked well and perhaps areas where they have not worked as well and need some tweaking. And then finally, um, and this is, um, this is for the, all the fiscal folks out there, and executive directors that allows agencies to perhaps adjust resource allocation. Perhaps you see, okay, that 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 program's working great. Perhaps you know we can look at this other program that we need to support more. So maybe, maybe shift some money towards that. Maybe we need to bring in some more training or another staff person. Again, it's a great way to get that quick snapshot of what's going on. All right. Okay. Now. We have a, a slide here um, that just kind of introduces this idea of social and health determinants of uh, determinants of poverty. And this is, uh, I think, a, a conversation that has really started to, I think, enter into uh, the world of community action with we have to understand what social and health determinants are. Um, we know that there is a clear relationship between health and economic status, and that one does impact the other, and that poor health it can be a result of poverty, and poverty can be the result of poor health. So if we have the opportunity to use an outcome scale matrix, um, this is a potential tool to, to help us identify some of those social and health determinants. Christine, this is a very, very timely topic for me because just this weekend I finished a book by Sarah Smarsh. Uh, her intense autobiography is titled Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth. And in it, and I do strongly recommend this book, especially for anyone who works um, in community action, but she discusses generational poverty alcohol abuse, hardworking farmers, and the failure of public health systems, and how all of those combined shaped her uh, growing up. In a separate essay, not in the book, but I read an essay by her yesterday, and she wrote, at the age of 50, my dad almost died when an infection from an abscessed tooth poisoned his blood and nearly stopped his heart. He never had any dental insurance and had seen a dentist only a handful of times. Poor teeth, I knew, beget not just shame, but more poorness. People with bad teeth have a harder time getting jobs and other opportunities. People without jobs are poor. Poor people can't access dentistry. And so goes the cycle. Yep, yeah, and Susan, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that is, um, that book actually, if you receive the ICA news, um, that book is on, uh, was on the recommended list now. Um, so thank you, Susan, for bringing that to our collective attention. And um, I, I ordered it yesterday on Amazon. Um, <laughs> so it is, it's coming my way. And, but this is, a, this is, again, the thing that we really need to consider um, in the work that we do, uh, this is something that I think we're being asked more and more to consider um, social and health determinants um, and, and really know and understand how if you are an individual who experiences poverty um, over your lifetime, that it does impact your health and well-being. It, it really is. It's uh, intertwined. 
It is, yeah, it absolutely is. And I think more and more data is being collected, especially by um, you know hospitals, um, other healthcare organizations, so we can have a firmer grip on what are some of the areas that we have some significant need. So here, here we come again to the logic model. I, I, this is where I always want to have like a drum roll or something, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so what we've done today uh, in, in discussing the logic model, because next week, this is where the drum roll is needed. That was my bad drum roll. Um, that we will be discussing the logic model with you all. And so each one of these uh, webinars has been leading up to a discussion of the parts of the logic model that are very important for us to understand. And today we talked about measurement, data source, and frequency of data collection and reporting. So that was all a conversation about accountability. If you look in the in the final six, seven, and eight columns in the logic model. But we also did tie it back to what the outcomes are. What are some of the outputs? Those are the services and activities. And what are the exalt the um, the results that we expect and then actually what happened. So we're tying this together. Yeah, how did you measure your data? Who collected it? Where was it collected from? How often is it collected? Where is it stored? Chances are you already know these answers, but if they're not on paper, mm, quite literally your whole staff might not be on the same page. That's absolutely right, and I'm going to bring this up. I, I think I've uh, referenced it um, perhaps each time we've talked about the logic model, but look what's at the bottom of the logic model. It's the mission, and the mission of the your agency is that guiding light that per, that really does illuminate the work that you do. It tells, it's the start of telling that story, and the question should always be whenever you're doing the construct of a new program or new funding is available, you look at the mission first. It supports and underscores absolutely all the work that we do at our community action agency. Okay, Susan. I th well, I think we're done. We are done. Um, so thank you all for par uh, participating and being with us today. If you have questions about this, uh, I know that we've provided our contact information in the past. More than happy to respond to any questions that you that you want to bring forward. Um, as Susan has mentioned in previous webinars and in this webinar, um, invite us to come um, spend a day with you training on Roma to really go deeper into how many of these processes work to practice them in the classroom and to really have conversation with one another about how to embed Roma into the work that we do. Yeah, my email is swilson2, that's S Wilson, then the digit two, at CEFS eoc.org. I will type it into my message. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and when the time comes, we can be face to face. I hope to be face to face with some of you. Uh, always, we're here, here to answer questions. And I do, one of the things I like to do if I come to your agency or to your program is I can um, personalize it. If your agency does, if your program does only housing or does only um, lie heap, I can make sure that that that's what we focus on. But not just Roma in general, but I can do it, you know, our, our exercises can be focused specifically on what you want it to be focused on. Yeah, and I, th I think that's really a great strength of of those of us who, who train Roma in Illinois is that we really want to talk about your programs. We, do, we don't want to talk about it from a generic perspective. We want to hear right. from you um, so we can really, uh, again, highlight for you and, and provide some insight into, into the work that you're doing. Um, so, and I will remind um, those of you um, today, and um, you've heard it from me before, but ROMA is in the organizational standards. Um, and so it is something that we need to dive into and understand. And I think that we've, again, we shared today, um, a scale is something that we're all very familiar with and we really look forward to supporting you in your work. Thank you so much for joining us. This webinar will be available on the IACA YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube, type in the Illinois Association of Community Action Agencies and uh, the last few times I did it, it was the fourth one down. <laughs> Interesting. Click, yes. And then uh, you have to um, subscribe to the channel. 
but all, all that encompasses is just clicking on it. And then you can watch, um, this is our fourth video and it will be posted soon, but the other three are there for you uh, to review or to share with other people in your agency who should be watching this which yeah. is everyone which is everybody <laughs> absolutely everybody and there are other um, webinars on there as well um, for your use and interest so uh, Su uh, Susan I want uh, again to express my appreciation to you for your willingness to be a part of this and the insight that you bring to this webinar series so thank you so much thank you Christine I I, I believe in Roma and I it's do, not a separate entity. It's what you already do. It just docu helps you document it. That and that is exactly right. Yes, we do this. We do this. It's it's actually comes quite natural to us as human beings. It's just we're looking at it from I think the community action lens um, that really helps us understand. You know what? I can Romanize everything. <laughs> and that's how that's how I live. So. Um, <laughs> So, all right, um, we've got a question. Oh, okay. Um, you mentioned a manual. Is Are there written materials that go with this series? Kimberly, yes, there is a manual, um, and you receive one if you, if you have a full day Roma training at your agency. There is a, an official Roma manual. In fact, there is a brand new one. It has a turquoise cover. Um, and that's what I've been, uh, Susan and I have been using that manual to create this series. Great question. All right, None, nothing yes. else? Go ahead. If you, okay. schedule, if you schedule a full day training with us, we um, everyone who is signed up, all participants who are there all day, get to keep a Roma manual. And what, what better for your home library than a Roma manual? Yes, um, where can I find a copy of the outcome matrix I'd like to use? And uh, that's from Melissa. Melissa, I'll get you a copy of that. All right, um, keep the questions coming. Um, if you, uh, once this webinar ends, you have contact information for both Susan and I, and we're happy to respond to your questions, but we'll see you all next week, I hope. And Susan, we'll be talking soon. Thank you so yeah. much. All right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.